to introduce this individual uh, with an intro that I wrote for him. But I forgot, this is another video that we didn't play, Giselle. We didn't play this video of this man as well on Saturday night. Let's play this right now so our viewers can see. Yo, yo, Avi, Tank Abby here. Congratulations on number 200 and running. Right on, brother. Keep it going. Great that Tank Abbott, guys. He's an incredible human being, uh, an author, definitely a man who is a historian, an educator, and also one of the greatest fighters of all time. I mentioned that last because to get to know him as a human being is really what it's all about. Guys, the biggest war you ever go through is right between your own ears. It's in your mind. We're all going through a war in our mind at some point, and we have to visit our mind to fight that war and win that war. Our next participant knows that the comeback is greater than any setback. This is due in large part to the fact that even death can never stay his hand. As he gazed upon the cold vastness of space and mused upon his life, he found that both are anything but empty. He's alive. He's here. And his purpose is indeed quite relevant. The man is multifaceted. He isn't just a fighter, but a historian and can, he can teach. It all began in the state of California, specifically Huntington Beach. His father was a lifelong football coach, and he played the sport as well when he attended Marina High School. But there was another sport in which he would have no peer and truly shine like a king. He was drawn to the mat since he was nine, watching his brother excel the sport. I speak of wrestling. He continued wrestling in college, where he was one of the best and an NJCAA All-American in that sport. As many would find out, his determination and pride were absolute. He was a man you could not thwart. Because if you did, your body he would contort, as you might wind up in pieces while they would transport you from the MMA ring to the airport. He attended California State University, Long Beach, where he graduated with a degree in history, something that speaks to me as teaching that subject is as rewarding as honey to a bunch of zealous bees. In the bars, he would always deck those that didn't bring it correct as they chose to bully others with something he would not ignore or neglect. While working at a liquor store to help pay for his college tuition, something in particular would occur. He noticed someone that was out of line, so he encountered said smart-ass customer. The customer turned out to be the son of a detective, and he pressed charges for assault. Here he was helping out a small business, and now it was all of a sudden his fault? I don't think so. One day he was reading a magazine at a store, and his attention was piqued when there was little known and new attraction called the UFC. He applied to UFC 6, and as an undefeated street fighter who could bench 600 pounds and knock out four men in his last brawl, it's safe to say that he more than qualified. There's plenty of video footage to indicate how his opponents were looking for some place to hide. But in the ring with him, there was no escape. Heck, they applied, and they'd all go down as a story as classic as Bonnie and Clyde. On July 6, 95, the world would become privy to a man that was there for the crown. He ran over the 400-pound Hawaiian fighter in 18 seconds as that poor guy went down. Next up was round two, that night where he further solidified his reputation by defeating Paul V with a ground and pound attack along with knee strikes. As yet another opponent sat there in bewilderment, wondering who turned out the damn lights. What an honest time for the UFC. This was no judges, no time limits, and the tougher guy got the win and walked out. He made it to the finals, and after facing him, the eventual champ couldn't even stand. The audience gave him a hand, as they loved him for his authenticity and his heart. His talent was quite grand. UFC 7 was next where he had an easy win over Steve Genomin, the first round with a neck crank. Next up was the legendary Dan Severn, but even Dan had trouble taking down this tank. Want a brief summary? How about the fact that he's a two-time UFC tournament runner-up, a three-time UFC semifinalist, a UFC heavyweight championship contender. He holds the record for most UFC tournaments, competed, and won the viewer's choice way before there was a thing called social media trends. In 97, he even co-starred on an episode of Friends. Both the WWE and WCW took notice of this massive talent, but in the end, Bischoff and WCW signed him, and pro wrestling fans had their first glance. As he was one of the top guys taking it to Goldberg, the Steiners, Sid, and hell, we found out that he could even dance. He was featured in one of their video games, and even after that run, he continued to knock people out. Many people would talk to talk, but could do nothing better in his presence than sit and pout. His resiliency and courage needs to be addressed, as he died five times in an operating table and had six strokes for many it would have been the end not for him thankfully as i consider him a good friend 107 days in the icu and amid this turmoil is what he did that would raise many an eyelid because he fought and survived the hardest fight of his life so stand up and welcome a man people know guys and gals they know him as tank from jersey to madrid a legendary kind humble human being 
Last name Abbott, first name David. David, welcome, my friend, to the Black Box. Wow, what do you say about that? That was awesome, Avi. Thank you very much for the kind words. Wow. Oh, you deserve wow. it. You wowed me. Oh, you deserve every bit of it, my friend. Uh, how are you doing this evening? Actually, pretty good. I actually just got done walking my dogs, and uh, it's kind of hot out here. I live out in Arizona, but uh, everything's going good. I've got no complaints, just enjoying the good life. You are, man. Every, every time we talk, every time we talk, Tank, I get this vibe that you're so content and happy and in a good place internally and externally, but you still have such passion and desire to do more. And whatever that more is, we'll talk about. But uh, I would dare say that as a writer and as an author, you were kind enough to send me your books. I picked up, I read them a while ago, of course. You were on the show about five months ago. You're in round number two now. Uh, writing is something you're very passionate about, David. Uh, yes, uh, I kind of stumbled onto it. Uh, people always were telling me I should write an autobiography, and I was thinking about a ghostwriter and all that, and I said, what the hell, I'll just do it myself. That way um, it could be more uh, truthful. Sure, sure. Know. And uh, I'm writing a novel. <laughs> so... It's actually about uh, a subject that I'm very familiar with, but it's a novel of uh, a character named Walter Fox who happened to be going to college and ended up fighting on TV after his little troubles with the law. And yeah. so I popped out my books before there are rules and I gave it to an editor and he said, this book is way too long. It was like over a thousand pages. And so he said, there's actually three natural breaks into it and I can make it into a trilogy. And I think that you're out because no one's gonna pick up a thousand page novel and read it. And I said, whatever we gotta do to get it out there. And uh, that's what we did. And so there's three books. Uh, before there are rules, there's Bar Brawler, Street Warrior, and Cage Fighter. And uh, it tells a story about a um, career college student who didn't really want to graduate. He was happy with the college life. And uh, time was coming for graduation. And the next thing you know, um, he ended up chasing his passion of street fighting. And... Uh, through many twists and turns in the rough and tumble world of the street and street fighting at bars, he finds himself on uh, a no holds barred television show that didn't exist ever. And um, he became uh, sure. a star, literally a star overnight. Uh, so like, uh, you know, people out there probably don't know that I went through a, uh, a very serious uh, illness uh, where I ended up getting a liver and a kidney transplant. I, I used to like to have a lot of fun as far as drinking. And uh, so my body couldn't keep up with me and I got a liver and a kidney transplant. During the liver surgery, I died five times and uh, that'll change uh, the way you look at life. And um, that's what I did, and uh, ever since then, I've, I've felt that there's something out there that that I can do. I, you know, I've kind of, I like to say, grown up maybe, or just uh, learned that there's, you know, not always about beating people up, uh, but finding the meaning of life and, and going after it and living it, and that's uh, how we ended up here. Yes. yes, you are you are living proof of that, my friend, because when you were on here part, as part of the Celebrity Tournament, of course, you're in round number two, which is about to kick off soon. But when you were here with Mark Rippon, NFL legend, and Brian Jordan, MLB, and NFL legend, two, two sport athlete, uh, you were able to tell us a lot of things about your past that were so revealing in a positive way. And I say positive because the reception we had from everybody else that were watching and commenting told me a story of how relatable it was to know that David Tank Abbott, who is considered by everybody to be one of the toughest human beings in the world, to me, was David Abbott. 
not just because of what you went through, but because when we first started speaking on the phone, it was David and Avi talking. And to realize that there's so many layers there, to realize that I'm speaking with an author, a history major, an educator, uh, a human being that puts so much emphasis on everything other than uh, the resume, so to speak. And God knows that's a resume to be proud of. I was so intrigued to know how you started writing. And I remember one of the stories was, you know, you're sitting there at a bar and, and, and you're writing these stories, which, by the way, as you mentioned, a lot of times being able to find out the format that works can be challenging. I, I tell a lot of the writers that uh, think of the beat sheet. There's something called a beat sheet where you can actually, you should introduce your main character by a certain page. You can set the theme of the movie by a page. You can create a conflict by a certain page. Uh, it seems to be very, very by the book, so to speak. But there are three dimensional characters that we can flesh out and there's ways to do that. When I read your books, they were fleshed out so well that I told myself it would be a shame if we didn't see these stories adapted to the full screen. I know that's something you're passionate about. I feel like it's going to happen. My question to you is this. How much of a... How much? How important is it to you to retain the ability to produce your own projects? Because they're yours. They came from your heart and your soul, my friend. Yeah, you know, um, not necessarily... I haven't thought that far into it. You know, I just, I, there's something out there that's just grabbing me and telling me... Like, I don't know if I can write, and I still don't know that, but... Oh, you I, can write. Know, you can definitely I'm, write. I know that I'm unorthodox. Um, I, not like it's going to be uh, Moby Dick or anything like that, but I thought that I could put out the uh, whole story better than telling it to somebody and have them interpret it. So I just took pen and pencil, uh, you know, pen and paper, and... Uh, started scribbling and I actually did it in a bar, believe it or not. Yeah. While, yeah. I was, while I was sitting there and I just said, Hey, what the hell? I'm not doing anything else, but staring at the ocean here. I was down under the pier there in Huntington beach. And I just started writing away about things that influenced my life and the people that were in my life. And I put it out there and then people are like, Hey, do you realize that you can write? And, at the time, no, I, I just said, I just write. I, there's nothing special behind it. I, nothing studied behind, behind it or anything like that. And that's what came out. And um, I checked it out on uh, audio. And I, I kind of surprised myself when I had the AI guy reading it. I was like, wow. I wrote that? <laughs> kind of one of those moments. But, I'd, like, yeah. I'd like to read some of these comments from our viewers. That's so inspiring. Uh, says Brian, your story is seriously very inspiring for Ramon. Kate, telling your own story can be helpful for both yourself and those who need to hear it. Um, uh, there's more. Uh, that is so amazing from Chad. Absolutely, Ed. Uh, good to see the change. Guys, you can buy these books because if you don't, you're going to miss out on some good stories. David's not bringing that up. I'm bringing it up. I'm asking you guys to go to Amazon and pick these up because they are quite the read. A lot of you on Saturday Night's show, uh, which is sort of our... Uh, the mothership of what we do, the green room on Saturday nights. That's where David competed on the tournament. Uh, I've already purchased these books, told us what it meant to you as well. Uh, Tank, going back a little bit as well, I want to bring this up because I think it's a really, really awesome story. Um, of course, you're born and raised in Huntington Beach. You began practicing amateur wrestling when you were about nine years old. You continued that through high school where you also played football. And then you continued wrestling in college where you were an NJCAA All-American you attended California State University, Long Beach, where you graduated with a degree in history. And it was around this time where you were trained in boxing by No Cruz, who also trained, I think, Carlos Palomino at the Westminster Boxing Gym. Is, is that right, Tank? You know, and and this whole thing, looking back on it, I don't know if everybody feels this way, but it seems like my whole life is written. You know, I, you, when you, you get existential... Uh, thoughts going on in your head when all the things that I've gone through, um, you start exploring different uh, ways and thoughts of things you, you think about and spiritually, like it's out there. Like, you know, somebody wrote this whole thing for me, you know, sure, it, sure. It, it's kind of uh, strange, but um, I just follow the path that comes my way. You know, it's not something that, I sought out, I planned, 
or uh, have an agenda to, to push. I just, I flow with, I go with the flow and I ended up writing three, three novels that I think call me a little biased, but after listening to them on Audible, I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Very much so. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe you push it on to something else, you know, be the modern day Rocky or something like that. Uh, look, I like oh, the way you you and I definitely talked about this uh, many a times, even today. I think I think it's a story or stories that can be told. There's no doubt about that. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions here, my friend, because I think a lot of our viewers as well uh, would probably be very interested to know that when it comes to the days of the UFC that you were a part of, people need to understand that when you fought in the UFC, it was the most honest time the UFC ever experienced. There were no judges there was no time limits. The tougher guy always got the win and always walked out of the ring. Whereas now you got judges and all sorts of things, and it turned it's kind of turned into more like a circus than it was. Would you agree? Uh, from your opinion, David? I don't go with a circus, but it has definitely turned into a skill. Um, of like more or less like like a wrestling or boxing. It's turned into a skill where these guys are very skilled fighters. There's there's a lack of uh, 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 emotion. But by, by circus, I mean the promotional aspect of it, where now they feel like they have to market these guys like pro wrestlers, when essentially back then, if you didn't know how to get in the ring and kick some butt, you weren't going to go far. Yes, it's very true. And the first five shows – were kind of to showcase jujitsu. And so after the first five shows were run by the Gracies and, he, and their jujitsu is tough as can be, it's a martial art, but they sold the show and music producers took over and they said, we're not gonna push jujitsu or anything else. We're gonna be honest and put whoever is wrestlers and and boxers and all that in the one area and they can compete well they came across me and i said i was an amateur wrestler and um my amateur wrestling career got uh stopped because of a car accident that's how my teeth got knocked out and and my knee got banged up and so that was that but I also was not one to turn away from a bully or, you know, it's almost like a cliche. I was the bully's bully, but there's a lot of uh, big mouths out there, smart asses that think they're tougher than they are. And they ended up usually picking fights with me. And I ended up getting in a street fight with a cop's son who was manhandling his girlfriend. At any rate, I uh, got in trouble for that. I went to go check in, and they said, we already have a wrestler, so there's not going to be any amateur wrestling thing for me. And I go, well, I just got, you know, in trouble. For, and they said, hey, we're going to call you Tank after any which way but lose from the movie um, uh, Clint Eastwood, any which way but lose. Uh, Tank Murdoch was the guy's name, and so sure. that that was with the. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that movie was with the uh, the orangutan. And then I ended up coming into the show as a street fighter, and that's why it's so honest. And everything from UFC on six on, for there was a window there where there was nobody uh, pushing a certain martial art or anything like that, and. I like to think that my fight, which was the first fight of UFC 6, was the first uh, original honest fight. And, I, want, uh, I want to bring this up, too, because it happened on July 6, 1995, uh, when we're talking about UFC 6. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that fight is it, you actively cultivated this this amazing tough guy character, but it wasn't a character. I mean, you, you were given a, a very – just a very honest interview in which you were talking about the martial artists. I remember the Hawaiian fighter 
John Matua. I think he weighed about 400 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. And, I mean, you took this guy out in the first 18 or so seconds of your opening fight, and then you further solidified your reputation as a no-nonsense, amazing fighter by uh, continuing on and advancing and being pitted against someone who was uh, kind of a heavier adversary, Paul Varelins. And after you returned to the cage in the midst of strong cheers, you knocked him out via the ground and pound and knee strikes. Uh, your your interviews also showed a passion uh, for the sport, a confidence that people hadn't quite seen just yet. You really spoke to a lot of people who were kind of experiencing UFC for the very first time, David. In those days, you got my brain uh, twirling and uh, memory. Um, I was like, finally, you guys can see what a real fight is. This is what happens on the street and everything else. And the martial artists were kind of shocked. Um, but so that's where I came from. And uh, I guess, you know, hey, you asked me a question and I just, who I am. So I told you, that's what it now, all those all those guys expected me to get beat up by all the martial artists because they were technically skilled and all that. And um, the world found out it was different at that time. And it literally overnight uh, was kind of strange experience. No one knew who I, no one knew who I was. And then the next day it was like uh, becoming a. Uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, one of those guys. It was like, oh my <laughs> God, everywhere I go, everybody's, oh my God, it's Tank Abbott. It was like, oh, it was a little crazy. Well, you know, I want a little known fact that our viewers should know about as well regarding uh, Mr. David Tank Abbott here, guys and gals and pals who are watching here on the Black Box Live on Wednesday. Uh, you're a pioneer. There's no doubt about the fact that people celebrate you because you were a part of the period of UFC's genesis. You know, you had this, you were the first fighter to regularly wear that, what became the standard MMA gloves in your fights. You were known as a seasoned street fighter. You fought anyone at any given time. But you were also an All-American junior college wrestler. You wrestled since you were nine years old all the way up to college. So you felt, and I'm assuming this is the case, when it comes to pedigree, when it comes to being able to be a diverse fighter, you had a lot of tools in your toolbox, David. Absolutely, and I'm not going to say names, but I'll, I'll say this. I trained with a world champion, and I'm sure if you asked him uh, if I knew how to wrestle, he, he would probably tell you very much so. And as far as boxing and everything else, I'm, I'm a world-class level, I, all those skills. And everybody likes to, to focus in on uh, the tank part of it, the street fighting part of it, where... Yes, I wasn't one to walk away from a fight or a big mouth, but um, if you wanted to go on a skills match, on a wrestling mat, in a boxing ring, or on a jiu-jitsu mat, basically is a wrestling mat, but any of that, I, I'm, I'm skilled at all of those things. And um, I like to think that I bring street fighting uh, mentality to it. When basically you get in a fight with somebody and they're trying to kill you and you're trying to kill them or have the ability to kill them and it's your choice not to. I want to read some, uh, uh, some quotes here that I jotted down, uh, David. Some that I have obviously will attribute to a, a book that I'm currently working on myself of my own quotes, original, some from other scholars. I want to get your reaction out of these quotes. Uh, there's a quote here that I think is very apropos. I want to get your take on this. People with goals succeed because they know where they're going. But taking the first step is the difference between actually pursuing your passion and just dreaming about it. Your thoughts? Yes, it's true. But um, believe it or not, I had a lot of fear back in those days of over shooting my mouth, even though I knew I could do it, I, I, I didn't want to be sound braggadocious, like, oh, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. But um, 
that became a hindrance. But once I got over th that kind of situation, it applies. You have to go after your goals and what you want to do and do what you have to do, which all falls back to discipline. And you know what you need to do. And if you have the skills and the talent to do it, sure. then make it happen. Don't hold yourself back. It'll work That's for me. Fair. That's very true. Uh, another quote I want to read for you because uh, your reaction to this actually is very similar to my own mindset. You're right. Uh, you could be your own worst enemy or your own best friend. It's our choice. That's the key. Uh, the other quote I want to read to you is this. We shouldn't have to worry about fixing our problems. We should fix our thinking because then the problems fix themselves. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's true. And, and trust me, my mind goes a million miles an hour nowadays. And um, I have to have uh, conversations with myself. Like, hey, you're overthinking this. Calm down and things will happen the way they're, they're written, the way, the way it's supposed to be. And worrying about it and everything else, it just comes back to a waste of time and personal torture. That's such a good point that you mentioned how it is a waste of time to torture ourselves. Uh, why beat ourselves up with a, with a hammer, maybe a feather? But no, no, no reason to beat ourselves up at all. Uh, I, I appreciate you, man. I really do. And again, guys, those who are watching, uh, we're looking at our YouTube numbers here, 1,247 live right now. We appreciate you as well. Uh, again, six-figure views across the board during the last four matchups of round number one. We'll talk a little tournament with Tank, guys and gals. But Mr. David Abbott uh, is a man who's an educator, again, a historian, and a friend, and a friend, someone who I have great conversations with because of who he is and what he stands for. And that is such a rare thing in this wacky industry. Uh, guys, I got to tell you, I think some of you know this. I don't know if David does, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, the studio I work for loves this network. Whereas a year ago, they said, no, you're not going to do it. It's not going to do well. Well, guys, we're doing great because we're not trying to be anything other than who we are. Uh, my last quote to read for you, Mr. Abbott, is this. Most people fail in life, not because they aim too high and miss, but because they aim too low and hit. Your thoughts? Mm. Yeah, there's some truth to that. You can learn to be poor, you know. Um, if you think like that, it's all about your thinking. It's, it's a very true, true statement. And you, you have to think out of the box sometimes for some people even uh, to a higher situation. Whereas, you know, if you're going to, if you think you can do it and, and you talk yourself into doing it, it's possible. And when you don't think you can, well, you can manifest that for yourself. That's just not a good thing to do. It's a very good point. <laughs> I do want to bring this up here, guys and gals. David Abbott is in round two of this tournament, and I agree. Whatever you manifest might come to fruition. It may not always be a good thing. Uh, there is something I want to ask right now because I think Mr. Abbott, again, as a well-rounded individual, uh, is able to discuss things that aren't just typical. Again, we're able to explore and go to different places all the time here, and we appreciate that. But I'd like to have uh, my co-host Giselle tonight ask a question. I know she's going to ask one as well to Mr. Abbott, any questions she'd like. Uh, a couple of our viewers, we'll pop them in. You guys can ask David Abbott anything you'd like as well. And guys, remember, I'm going to continue mentioning his books as I have been because they are quite the read. And if for nothing else, you could read these books and lose yourself and be inspired because we all know that in this year, especially in 2024, we could all use some inspiration. We can all move away from the politics and all the all the talking heads that want to divide us. Reading these books, really, if I were to sum them up with my own tagline, it would be inspiration meets purpose. And that's what you're going to get when you read these three books. They're a trilogy, and they were written by Mr. David Abbott, who won't say this about himself, but I'll say it about him, is a well-rounded, intelligent, thoughtful person who happens to be in this tournament as well. Uh, Giselle, let me bring you in here. And any questions you'd like to ask Mr. Abbott, feel free. 
Hi, Mr. Abbott. I'm so happy you are joining us on a Wednesday evening on the Black Box tonight. So my question for you this evening is, what is the most interesting place you've visited and why? Well, I've um, been to a lot of places, but I, one place that I always used to say, uh, when you go on a vacation, don't go back because it's not, if you had a great time, it's, it's really hard to uh, do it again. But um, this place, I, I used to go quite a bit. It's down, um, it's called East Cape. It's in Cabo, Mexico. You fly in there and then you go to the Sea of Cortez. And it's um, a place where uh, it used to be, I don't know if it is anymore, but you could go out, it's like the old man in the sea, go out and fish and uh, marlin and that. And, drink beers and on the way out and then on the way in, hang out at the hotel and just lose yourself. There's no such thing as anything else but what's going on there. And it was an awesome time and place. But things change. I don't I don't know if it's still the same place anymore. But uh, Los Barrillos, it's uh, on the Sea of Cortez in Cabo. Went there many times. I would, I would like to go. So you mentioned The Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway. Have you read a lot of Hemingway? I haven't, and I, I don't do much reading. So I haven't even read my book. I've, I've listened to it on audio. Or audible. Well, guys, check this out here. Uh, I need you to go to Amazon.com right now, guys, because uh, please, the, the Bar Brawler, you see these amazing books here written by Mr. Abbott. Uh, they're very deep. You can get the Audible version. You can get them on Prime. Uh, these are a trilogy, guys. You can get any of these books. They're available on paperback. Uh, Mr. Abbott, an, an incredible writer. So you can find this. It's very accessible. All you guys have to do is go to Amazon.com, and you will get these books, and you will be able to... You know what, guys? I'm going to make this a little bit harder on you. How about this? I know Mr. Abbott may not condone, but I'm going to do this. If you guys want to have your comments pulled up, you better send me a book report on all of Mr. Abbott's oh. books. By next Wednesday, by next Wednesday, uh, you're going to enjoy reading these books. I did. Uh, again, Mr. Abbott was kind of to send them to me. Uh, let's bring in a couple of our viewers with some questions for Mr. Abbott as well. Brian, I'm going to bring you in first. Brian, any questions you'd like to ask Mr. Abbott on screen? Uh, the floor is yours. Hey, Mr. Abbott, how you doing? Hello, Brian. I had a, my only question, one of my few questions for you is, uh, the first time you hit somebody in the ring, how did that feel? It was uh, a regular practice for me, so um, it, was not, <laughs> it was not that exciting. It was, I was uh, supposed to get killed by this guy that I was fighting. Like, not, a, it was supposed to be, a, a, I was supposed to be demolished. And so when I hit him and I saw his eyes get big, I just said, yeah, that's right. This is more to come. And uh, that's it. Wasn't I was seasoned at that time? Let's put it that way. That's uh, that's really cool. Um, uh -huh. you know, it, it's funny you say that. I when I went to basic, it, it's funny because you were one of the people that I used to watch growing up, and I joined the military, uh -huh. and I always wanted to fight because of it. Well, anyways, we get into basic, and you know you have to let off steam somehow, and. Yeah. We had 60 men to two bays. It was a uh, um, third platoon and fourth platoon. And we all decided together, we said, look, you know, nobody tell the DS, but it's hands on. Let's do it. So there was 120 men brawl in the bay. <laughs> Next morning, right. DS looks at us. He's like, did you guys want to fight, Mo? Right. No. <laughs> right on. Okay. And Brian, uh, great question. Thank you for serving our country, my friend. Thank you, and thank you very Likewise. much, Tank. Do what you do. Like, likewise. Have a good one. Guys and gals, uh, two more questions, and then we are going to go again. Uh, we do want to remind you guys, Eric Roberts, this Saturday night live on uh, The Mothership, The Green Room, 201st episode later this Saturday live, as always live. Following week, Lenny Wilkins, three-time Hall of Famer, uh, one of the greatest basketball players and coaches of all time. 
uh, will be trying to uh, get his redemption and make it back to this tournament against the mystery opponent as well. Mr. Abbott is already in round number two. Chad, if you have a question for Mr. Abbott, the floor is yours. Hey, good evening, Mr. Abbott. How are you tonight? I'm doing good, Chad. How are yourself? You doing good? Great. Good? You're doing yeah, awesome. Good. Um, just right a quick on. question for you. Just kind of wondering, uh, what do you kind of do for a hobby in your pastime? Oh, boy. Um, I used to uh, party all the time, but that I ran, my luck ran out and that. My body couldn't keep up. So nowadays, I... Uh, I live out here in the desert, and I work in my back part of my property doing building fences and doing the landscaping and all that kind of stuff. But I also work out at the gym and uh, hang out with my wife. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, if, yeah. I might, if I might, I have one more quick question, so I really would love to know the answer. Who was your toughest opponent you've ever had to face? Well, um, just because it lasted for 14 minutes plus would be Oleg Tartarov in my first show that I fought in. Um, just, uh, he was kind of fresh because he didn't have two fights before me that were serious enough for him to get tired. So I was fighting him, and boy, let me tell you something. That guy's a tough, tough man. I, I beat on him and beat on him and beat on him, but uh, he wasn't going to quit. And I would definitely say he is probably my toughest fighter, for sure. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for uh, answering my questions. It was uh, very much an honor to meet you tonight, sir. Oh, likewise, and you have a good night. You too. You, Chad. Appreciate you. Uh, guys, let's bring in Ramon for our final question of the evening to Mr. Abbott. Ramon. Evening, Mr. Abbott. How you doing? Hey, Ramon. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Um, simply put, my only question is, throughout your life and just throughout your success and your, your journey to following your dreams, what was what was the big thing that just kept you going? Wow, you know, I haven't had that question. Um, it's just a natural innate pull to do what I love to do, and that was was fighting. I mean, there's nothing better than a good fight. And um, then uh, the only thing that kept me going was when I got sick was to live. And... Um, it's been almost six years since my transplant. It's been over six years. And uh, those are the best years of my life so far. So I guess living, you know, you got to get out there and live. <laughs> uh, sometimes the best way, living your life, yeah, having right. fun doing it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. It's nothing quite like being alive, guys and gals. Mr. Yeah, Ramon, thank you. Appreciate yeah, you. Uh, Mr. Abbott, I'm going to ask you this question, my friend, regarding – uh, the tournament, are you looking forward to round number two? Oh, absolutely. Um, kind of was on shaky ground at first, not knowing what to expect. Now that I know know what's going down, I'm, I'm getting prepared mentally, and I, I'm ready for it now. Uh, six, six rounds in total. Uh, as of yeah. now, looks like if you look at the numbers, 119 Hall of Famers and award winners from Hollywood Music, Film, Sports, it's a great conversation. We get to know one another, which is great. But at the end of the day, winning 13 grand and stripped it for two degrees is pretty damn cool as well. Right, Mr. Abbott? Oh, yeah. My wife's on the other side of this laptop here Woo! going, yeah, putting her <laughs> hands above her head. <laughs> I love that. Making sure I don't say anything stupid. I love that, my friend. Hey, uh, one, one final observation. I have to ask you this. Mr. Abbott, I'm going to ask Giselle this question as well. But first, Mr. Abbott. Are you the guy that can wait? I can't. Are you the guy that can wait a full two minutes when you receive microwave directions? You put the dish in. They tell you you got to warm it up for two minutes. I usually go a minute 54. I can never wait. I'm not patient enough to wait the full two minutes. How about you? Well, when that happens, I, I make a game out of it and try to see how long I can hold my breath. <laughs> I love that. How about this? Got to ask you some quick questions here. A little moments of levity. Why not? 
Um, this is a question I usually ask a lot to some of the luminaries that we have here, or it's more an observation. Do you realize that the object of golf is to play the least amount of golf? Absolutely. Yeah. That's you that's actually. Why, that's why I don't play. I don't play it either. I'm not a golf fan. <laughs> I'm really not. I'm not a golf guy. Uh, how about this? Uh, the word bed. You actually write the word bed out. The word bed looks like a bed. The word bed? Yeah. Looks like a bed. Yeah, think about it. B-E-D. The word actually looks like a bed. That's above me. I, I had five strokes also. Question for you. <laughs> My question. wife's going, it does. It does. <laughs> My question for you and your wife. If yeah. Carmen San Diego and Waldo ever got together, would their offspring just be completely invisible? I'm gonna I'm deferring to her and she's stuck. <laughs> she said they're never invisible. Indivisible. Okay, last question. Do you like I don't like being the person with a remote in a room full of people watching TV because there's a lot of pressure. You know, you might like the show. But will they judge you if you keep that particular show on? Do you want the remote in your hand or in somebody else's hand? Oh, it's always in my hand. That's why I got a good wife. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, guys and gals, this is Mr. David Tank Abbott, who, again, blessed us with his time. I do want you guys to check out his incredible books on Amazon. I've mentioned them before. I'll continue to mention them again because they're very worthwhile. Uh, we know that a lot of our luminaries, like Lou Ferrigno, has read the book. Lou, Lou, Lou's in round number two. And uh, because he was on this show and he was recommended the book, you never know when people say, yeah, they're going to get it. But then when you talk to him two weeks later and he says he delves into David Abbott's book, that's a pretty cool thing. You guys got to read the, all three of these books. They're trilogies. Read them in order. Uh, amazing to find out so many things about you every time we speak, my friend. It's always been fun and it's my pleasure. Thank you. Anything you'd like to tell our viewers, the floor is yours. Oh, man, just go out and live your life and have a good one while you're doing it. I'm going to talk have to you fun. soon, my friend. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, David, David Abbott, guys and gals.